<laughs> so that's, um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and to start this off, um, to describe myself, uh, I am a Christian, conservative, heterosexual man that is a 2A advocate. I believe in our country, I believe in our military, and I believe in our police officers. And half of our country's head just popped off the pillow and decided they were going to play the victim by what I just said. Um, and that's a shame. So when things happen in our government, you know, one side decides to, to cry about it and uh, find their safe space. And when things happen in the government that we don't agree with, most of the time we just live another day. I think that's our job as Christians to set that standard uh, about what that looks like. So before we get into it, I'm going to start us off in prayer. God, we just uh, we come to you today, Father. I just I want to thank you <clears throat> for giving me this message, uh, God. And I have no doubt that it was on my own conviction, things that I struggle with. Um, I have no doubt that these words are from you, God. So I just ask that you just remove me out of the way, God, and just let people see you. I just pray for open minds and softened hearts for the topic that we're about to discuss today, God. And just at the end of the day, just know that everything revolves around you and your son. We thank you for sending him to the cross. God, for through him, we can have a relationship with you. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Man, Jesus is already calling, ain't he? Y'all's yeah, my family in the front row, by the way, so... Uh, so maybe that'll lighten the mood a little bit. Um, man, so I got a couple of quotes that I want to start off before we get into Scripture. Um, it says, I have no fear that the result of our experiment will be that men may be trusted to govern themselves without a master. That's Thomas Jefferson, 1787. We may define a republic to be a government which derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for a limited time or during good behavior. That's James Madison, 1788. Liberty must at all be supported. We have a right to it derived from our maker. But if we had not, our fathers have earned and bought it for us at the expense of their ease, their estates, their pleasure, and their blood, that's John Adams, 1765. The moment the idea is admitted into society, property is not as sacred as the laws of God, and there is no force of law and public justice to protect it. Anarchy and tyranny commence. John Adams, again, 1787. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the Declaration of Independence, 1776. Some of those quotes are scary, and of what this could look like. I have no doubt that we're living out some of this stuff right now. <clears throat> so with every message comes a warning. Warnings are, if Congress can indefinitely for the general welfare, welfare and are the sole and supreme judges of the general welfare, they may take the care of religion into their own hands. They may appoint teachers in every state, parish, pay them out of the public treasury. They may take into their own hands the education of children, the establishing in like manner schools throughout the union. They may assume the provision of the poor, where the power of Congress to be established in the latitude contended for it would subvert the very foundations and transmute the very nature of the limited government established by the people of America. That's a warning from James Madison. There is now even something of ill omen amongst us. I mean that increasing disregard for law which pervades the country. The growing disposition to substitute the wild and furious passion in lieu of the sober judgment of courts and the worse than savage mobs for the executive ministers of justice. The, dis the disposition is awfully fearful in any community and that it now exists in ours. It would be a violation of truth to deny. That's a warning from Abraham Lincoln. 
Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. It's a warning from John Adams. When they set all this in place, there was a fear of what might happen if people separated from God. I mean, those guidelines and everything, they were Christian-based, Christian fact, Christian backed, and they were fearful of what it might look like even back then when they started it. <clears throat> so today, I'm going to focus on two reasons why Christians should obey the government. There are obviously several reasons. Uh, I'm going to focus on two, and then I'm going to break it down to just one. It's going to be very simple. So in some form or fashion, we all have to deal with the government. The thing is, is we have to choose what kind of and how we respond towards our government. And that is in all aspects, no matter what, what level, whether it's the state level, local level, national level, <clears throat> that reaction and attitude towards its leaders, its rules, and its laws. So our inclination most of the time is to be disrespectful to certain government leaders because we believe they're not worthy, not worthy of our respect. We don't accept the legitimacy of their authority. I and mean, I just basically called the White House a nursing home a second ago. There's a lot of people that probably disagree with that. Um, our inclination is sometimes to disobey or ignore laws and rules because they seem unfair or even outrageous. Some of the laws that are, uh, you know, that I struggle with on a personal level, I mean, I have two daughters where <clears throat> men are being able to compete in women's sports, I think is a travesty to not only, not only the sporting community, but everything that women have fought for for the whole time to have equal rights, and it's being trampled because somebody thinks they're a unicorn for a day. Um, I struggle with that. And some people go even further by disobeying or ignoring government's laws and actually fight against government. That leads to civil unrest and sometimes even domestic ter uh, terrorism. The thing that happens is with people are quick to label. What they do is they label and they group. Uh, I say that I'm probably not as guilty as this as some. So when something happens in a Christian group, does something, they automatically just bundle every Christian in together. You know, you see documentaries like uh, the Branch Davidians in Waco and that, how all that took place. Anytime there's a shooting, uh, people want to group everybody that believes in our Second Amendment into one group. Um, that terrorism is a, is, a, is a real thing. I know people in our, our military take an to protect this country from terrorism, foreign and domestic. It's happening more and more within our country. As Christians, however, we're not free to deal with the government or its laws and leaders as we choose. As Christians, we have a mandate to respond to the government or governing authorities in a specific way. So I'm going to read Romans 13, 1 through 7. So if y'all could get to that, <clears throat> shout amen when you do. Everyone must submit himself to the authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, 
to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities of God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. We have a God-given mandate to respond to governing authorities in a certain way. <clears throat> the word submit, which is in verse 1, submit to the governing authorities. The definition is accept or yield to a superior force or the authority or will. So basically in layman's terms, it means to obey the person or institution that we're submitting to. There's a quote that says, it is important to understand that one cannot truthfully claim to be adhering to this biblical injunction of submission if they are at the same time actively disobeying the laws or leaders of the land. Now, the Christians that, uh, that Paul is writing to, they're in a situation where it was difficult to submit, obey, maybe even to respect those in government. Sounds familiar. Their government leaders were even more immoral than ours are today. I'm going to repeat that. Their government leaders were even more immoral than ours are today. Some of their laws and rules were even more outrageous and difficult to keep. So because of this, the Christians of the day, of today, would have been resistant towards Paul's exhortation to obey the government. Because of this, the Western church of today would be getting a letter from Paul. Paul gives us two reasons. He illustrates these for obeying governing authorities, and they're very simple. It's the right thing to do, and it's the smart thing to do. So we're going to be in Romans 13, 1 through 7, but I'm going to give Will Green uh, some more scripture to about Wednesday night. So there's the plug for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, it's at 7 o'clock. Y'all come, show Will some support. I'm just going to break down these scriptures. I'm going to give y'all time to write them down. That way it's not just, you know, seven verses. I got Hebrews 13 and 17. Titus 3 and 1. The one in Daniel I'm going to actually read. It says, Daniel 2 and 21, it says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Now, we need to remember when Daniel, so he refused to pray to King Darius, and he was actually thrown into the lion's den for doing so. Um, hold on to that. I'm going to come back to it. First Peter 2 and 17 and then 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Everybody get all that? All right, so those two points are how Paul summarizes his message in verse 5. And I'm kind of just going to skim over that again. It says, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, the right thing to do, but because of conscience the smart thing to do. He says it's necessary to submit to those in authority because failure to do so would violate our conscience, which helps us distinguish right from wrong, and because of possible punishments for obedience. So I'm going to read verse 1 again. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So why is it the right thing to do? Everyone must submit. Every one means everyone. You are not exempt. I am not exempt. Our parents are not exempt. Your kids are not exempt. Back then, though, in their minds, you know, they were, they thought they were God's people. They thought they didn't have to listen to the government. In their minds, they didn't have to do what the government said because they recognized no authority except God's. 
Paul goes on to tell us why it's the right thing to do. He says, there is no authority except that which God has established. The attitude of many, both past and present, is that some governments and its officials are evil or even illegitimate. They feel they don't have to be obeyed. Laws don't apply to them because they're, you know, maybe they don't agree with them. Sometimes could even be selectively enforced. The Bible gives us no excuse or reason not to do so. According to God's own word, God's word, not mine, there is no government that was not established by him. That's across the board. Democracies, communism, you name it, it has been established by God. So this means that we are to obey the governing authorities, whether they are Democratic, Republican, Christian, moral, immoral, the list can go on and on. Mike has even given a message before, um, I think he called it, it's, it's biblical, not political. That's kind of the guidelines I went with this. Um, we're supposed to obey the governing authority, and it is what it is. Obeying the government is the right thing to do, again, because they were established by God. So the question is, does this mean that everything the government does is approved by God? Absolutely not. The reason why is because our government is made up of men, human men, women, sinful nature. Governments across the world are composed of people. Does this mean that we're to obey the governing authorities if they tell us to do something that goes against God's word? Absolutely not. We are to obey authority, but the highest authority is God. I just mentioned the reason why Daniel was thrown into the lion's den uh, because of King Darius. God's command supersedes the government in the same way that local law is below state law, state law is below national law, and up the chain you can go. So we're going to turn to Acts 5, 27 and 29. You don't have to turn there. It's up on the board. It says, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. So Peter refused to obey the Sanhedrin's command about spreading the gospel. We must obey God rather than men. 99% of the obeying the government's laws usually don't require to obey God. That's a pretty stout statistic. Um, I found that on the World Wide Web, so it's got to be true. Um, <laughs> but this means that we should obey the government in all matters. All matters. Business, traffic laws, criminal laws. I even put two down here, and I'm going to go back on these. Gun control. Prohibition against publicly led prayer in public schools. Now, I told you earlier that I was an advocate for our Second Amendment, and I am 100% in support of faculty and student-led prayer. They can't stop you from doing that. It's freedom of speech, freedom of religion. How it is a law that goes against public-held prayer in school. Luckily, we still live in the South. We are very involved in our schools. Our schools are very involved in our community. We have events like Meet You at the Pole uh, that we have been 100% support of. Eric Aiken comes in every year. Uh, we have organizations like Fellowship of Christian Athletes, things that we really support. Um, but they're laws. They're laws that we need to obey and that we need to abide by. So that makes it the right thing to do. 
So the other reason why we should obey, that's in verses 2 through 4. It says, consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do it, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an angel of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. It's the smart thing to do. So to summarize all these verses, Paul's encouraging um, Christians to obey the government just because of the consequences. Sometimes they can be severe. Um, Obeying the government is the smart thing to do because those who disobey God will be punished. And those who disobey the government are, in a sense, disobeying what God has instituted. So as Paul says in verse 2, those who rebel against authority are rebelling against what God has instituted. Now, I know that most of this title and most of this message is about government, government officials, but that goes for anybody in authority. Police, military, first responders, even your bosses, even our school teachers, educators. Um, there's a level of, of accountability that is getting lost in our kids, higher generations uh, of kids that don't know what it is to be held accountable. So even if, like, my wife and I went out last night, dinner with some friends, um, we had our oldest watch our youngest, and even though they're siblings, um, our oldest babysat them, or her. When she goes with Gigi, Lolly and Pops, Chucky, whatever, whoever she goes with, we trust her to do what they say. They, she better listen because their authority comes from us. So disobeying them would be no different than disobeying us. They don't, might not like the rules, but since we appointed them, disobeying them is the same as disobeying us. And again, that's not the smart thing to do. It's the same with Christians and the government. God established the governing authorities, and it's not wise to disobey what God has instituted. So in verse 2, he says, those who choose to obey the government will bring judgment on themselves. Now, it's not clear um, who Paul is talking about. All he says is you can and will be punished. But it's not clear if he's saying that God will punish them directly or that the governing authorities will punish you. Verse 3 indicates that the punishment comes via the government, but those, uh, <clears throat> those punishments can look like different things. You have fines, imprisonment. Man, some countries and religions will even put you to death for breaking the law. Whether punished by God or by the governing authorities, the main point is that it's the smart thing to do. Again, we talked about that. I'm going to beat those two in the ground. So the negative... Uh, when I mentioned about the Christian groups doing something or the Second Amendment groups doing something anytime there's a shooting, uh, I watched a documentary uh, a couple months ago uh, on that group, the Branch Davidians, and it was called, I think it was called Waco. It was the one that it was the live, like they interviewed the people. It wasn't a movie. Um, so that negative view of government increased for Christians when this happened. Many people thought that David Koresh was the second coming of Christ. Now, in that documentary, you know, was our government's responsive? Some could view that as such. The thing is, is they were, they broke the law. They broke the law. They were storing and manufacturing guns. They were storing and manufacturing ammunition that weren't legal to own. And because of that, these people thought this man was the second coming of Christ, and a lot of people died. So what happens is, is when you see people like, uh, I can't remember the group name, there was a Baptist church that was literally picketing soldiers' funerals when they would come home, saying they were baby killers and homophobic and transphobic and Islamophobic and just, just horrible things. There's even a, a pastor that 
<clears throat> has said in front of his congregation that if you vote Democratic, you are evil and to get out of his church. Man, we missed the point on the gospel. We missed the point on the gospel. And it's separation between church and government. You create a bigger gap between what the church is supposed to do, and that is to lead everybody to Jesus. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, black, brown, purple, green, blue, we, we want you in the door. But when you do come, you're going to hear the truth. Sometimes the truth goes against the lifestyle that we're leading. That's the risk that we pay. Again, when I ask Micah, why does God give us these messages? Is it because he knows we're going to do it? So to summarize verse 3 again, the government is not a negative thing. It's a positive thing if you simply obey. For the most part, those who do the right thing by obeying the laws will not be harmed. So I don't fear getting stopped. I don't fear getting a traffic ticket because I obey the traffic laws. I don't fear the IRS coming in like we, because we pay our taxes. Uh, I'm going to shock my mom here, but I've been arrested countless times. <laughs> but guess what? I've never been shot, never been tased, because why? I did what they asked me to do. I know Heath back there grinning already. I can see him. <laughs> How many times have you had to do something because they, told, but because they did what you asked? How many times have you had to tase somebody because they did what you asked? Zero. So Paul's understanding is even the idolatrous and the immoral Roman government, they were not to get anybody. But they are God's agents to punish evildoers while rewarding those who do good. So for the most part, government is seen as a positive institution. But as we've all seen, it is a powerful institution go back to verse 4 again it says for he is God's servant to do you good but if you do wrong be afraid for he does not bear the sword for nothing he is God's servant an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the evildoer I think Paul's point in this verse is God's not going to leave the government powerless they can act against anybody who obey or disobeys their authority. And if you disobey, you should be fearful. And in quotes, the government does not bear the sword for nothing. That last phrase refers to their power to, in fact, punish you if you do wrong. But that is a God-given power, but it's also a power that you don't want to mess with. The government doesn't bear the sword for nothing. Those who rebel against the government's authority will be punished, and this includes Christians. So the intelligent thing to do is yield to the government's authority. It's the smart thing to do. So the last sentence in verse 4 says that the government is God's servant, an angel of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. That's a reminder that is that it, their responsibility to punish you if you do wrong. It says, I wrote down, seek vengeance. I don't know if it's vengeful, uh, but there is and can be severe punishment if you do wrong. <clears throat> and it's even wrong for Christians to do so. So don't get upset at the police, the prosecutors, legislators, the judge. It's their job to enforce these laws. Then that's God's word, not mine again. You know, I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> I feel like we're losing entire generations of kids uh, because of accountability. Um, I hold my kids accountable and their friends. <laughs> what happens is, though, is we try to hold them accountable because we can do it out of love, whether they think so or not. I want to hold them accountable because if we don't, the world will, or the police will. I'm going to be a lot more loving on you than the police, I promise you. Um, 
But the thing is, is they'll lie, cheat, steal, try to blame others to try to divert that accountability onto somebody else. My wife and I are firm believers in do as I do, not as I say. So I had a talk with my oldest a couple of months ago, and I said, I, you know what? I know I got in some trouble when I was younger, but I bet you if you call Lolly and, uh, and Pappy and say, hey, if I did some of the things I did, did I tell them the truth? So I wanted to find out for myself. I called my dad a couple of months ago, and I said, man, I got a question. I said, do you remember when I was a senior in high school and you noticed my screen on my window missing? He said, yeah. I said, what did I tell you? He goes, you said you threw it in the dumpster at Easy Mart. <laughs> I said, okay, well, that was the truth. I got tired of putting the screen back on my window once I snuck back into the house that the last time I did it, I just took it and threw it in the closest Easy Mart dumpster I could find. My dad's out mowing a couple of days later and asked me about the screen. I told him the truth. We always tell that to our kids. If you tell me the truth, I can deal with it. And behind closed doors, we might even laugh about it. But you're still going to get in trouble. The thing is, is we're always going to find out. And the more you lie, cheat, and steal to get to what you think you deserve, it's going to be worse. I remember getting in trouble coming in and just setting my keys on the table. Yep, I know how this is going to go. I knew what was going to happen. So we're going to jump into Romans 13, 5. It says, Therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible, possible punishment, the right thing to do, but because of conscience, again, the smart thing to do. So he summarizes these two reasons. He says we should obey the government because of poss possible punishment and conscience. Again, because it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. So verses 1 through 4 kind of explain why we should obey the government. Verse 5 is a summary of that explanation. And so verses 6 through 7 is where we learn to apply it. Verse 6 says, this is also why you pay your taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. Then honor. Bob, uh, Paul brings up the reason of taxes, because uh, back then that was probably the main area where people were most likely to disobey the government. And Paul repeats what Jesus says. Uh, in Mark 12, 14 through 17. Go ahead and pull that up. They said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity, swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Jesus knew the hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarii and let me look at it. They brought the coin. He asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they said. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Texas. They're not some evils that were spawned by Satan. They're approved by God. They're just as mandatory as tithes and offerings. The Bible says that we are to give everyone what you owe them. This means to give cheerfully and to pay your taxes. Verse 7 illustrates that it is not enough to obey government if you show disrespect to its leaders. This is going to taste like vinegar. We owe them, we owe them respect and honor by virtue of their God-given position, regardless <laughs> of their character, political, or spiritual ideas. Mm, that still stings. <laughs> if I move, it won't do it twice, right? So this does not mean that we always have to agree 
with those in authority. That principle doesn't mean you can voice your concerns or opposition to laws, opposition to agendas. It does mean that we have to have an attitude of respect and honor. We always say, you want to change something? Vote. Again, this is biblical, not political. Vote. You have a civil duty and an obligation. You silence yourself willingly if you don't let your vote be heard. Your vote is your voice. If you don't vote, I don't want to hear you complain. And some of the argument may be, well, my vote doesn't mean anything. Well, but you still have a voice. You can change it. 